All right, hi, I'm Major Jonathan Wright, and a couple of my students asked me to uh, readdress the, the lesson I covered uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, about basically how I constructed an A matrix. So uh, here I'm going to take you through a quick little history of uh, where you've been uh, and then take you to uh, where we are now. All right. So uh, this is, this is going to look a lot like a controls lesson uh, because at the end of the day it kind of is. Uh, my background is in controls. Uh, that's a picture of SimSat, uh, the satellite attitude simulator that I conducted my PhD research on. And uh, yeah, basically we needed to con build a Jacobian, construct a Jacobian to, to determine how these control moment gyroscopes were going to produce a torque as we rotated them. All right. So the input was a rotation of the control moment gyroscope and the output was a torque on the spacecraft. So here, here's uh, the problem statement that you guys are, are kind of used to uh, from high school calculus. All right. Uh, you have some linear function. All right. Uh, you put in an X and you can get out an F of X or a Y as we like to call it. Uh, for the record, we can put any randomly selected x in, evaluate f of x, and compute the, the y corresponding to that x. Right? Any, any at all. We just randomly choose one. Seven. We put it into a, a linear function. Forty-two. No problem. Pi. But this is how you, you're probably most familiar with seeing it. All right. uh, the teacher gives you some random y uh, and, uh, and the function, and you have to solve for the x, which, uh, when evaluated on uh, f of x, uh, gives you that y. So uh, there were kind of three different flavors to this question, if you recall. All right. One is they give you the entire function. Uh, they give you the value uh, that you're solving, the output value. Uh, and then all you had to do is solve for the input value by uh, inverting this function, right, and evaluating the inverse of that function at the desired output value. The second one, the second method they can give you is uh, what we refer to as a point slope. Right? Now they don't give you the entire function, but they give you the slope, uh, and they give you uh, a point, right? some nominal x and y coordinates, Right, and uh, from that you're able to solve for x star given uh, the point slope solution. Uh, then uh, they could also give you two points. All right. Now I know a lot of us uh, we take those two points and we'd solve for m, and then we we do the point slope uh, evaluation. But realistically, uh, we actually can solve directly for x star uh, without solving for the intermediate m. Right. All we need are those two points. Uh, so this this final version of this equation literally um, doesn't have anything to do with mx plus b. Right. It's 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 hidden away. All we're looking at is the function evaluated at two points. All right. Things started to get a little bit more challenging. All right. So uh, we got nonlinear functions. Right. In fact, sometimes we even got nonlinear functions that we we couldn't. Uh, Invert, right? So now all we have is a nonlinear function that we can invert, and a desired output value y star. So how can we solve for this x star? Well, let's go back to the three tools that we already have. All right, uh, we have okay. Well, we have a function. Well, we want to use this one, but we can't. Um, maybe, maybe there's something here that. That we can use, right? And then along came uh, Sir Isaac Newton, and he basically he changed the game. All right? What he said is, you know, if if I see this delta y over delta x and I take the limit of it, that just becomes my my new uh, derivative equation, which kind of relates to this slope point slope format. Uh, so now we can actually solve for the slope of the function given a function. And uh, yes, okay, uh, we're treating it like linear, but as long as we're in a, a relatively close region, we should be fine, all right? So here we are. We're, we're back to the problem statement. Uh, we're able to now differentiate the function. Uh, we can evaluate it at, you know, or theoretically, uh, but we still, that's just a slope. We still need a point, all right? We still need that nominal 
value. Well, remember, if we have the function, uh, then we can evaluate the function. And, and I keep clicking next like it's going to do something, but I actually need to. All right, so let's randomly select an x, uh, any one at all. Theoretically, we want it to be kind of close to the solution, but uh, beggars can't be choosers. Uh, if we evaluate the function at that x, uh, we can get a y. Well, now we have everything that we need in order to uh, evaluate this function. Right? Uh, unfortunately, we can evaluate it, but uh, the evaluation is uh, an iterative method, and we have to repeat that until uh, we actually converge to the correct solution. In this case, the correct solution is when y star minus y nominal is pretty much zero. All right, uh, and now this is this is massive because we're allowed to treat nonlinear functions as if they are linear. All right, so all all those tools that we learned, uh, we're still able to continue to use them, provided that we are intelligent and kind of wise in, about how how we use them. All right. So now enter uh, an even more less perfect world. All right, so now we don't even know the function absolutely no knowledge of the function. I'm calling this the black box problem. Uh, all we know is that if we input a value x, we get out some value y. All right? So let's go back to this. Uh, we, we've, we've already been kind of inserting a, a, an x and getting a y, so I'm, I'm going to keep those up there for now. Uh, but if only, if only we can treat the function as linear enough, then we can kind of, uh, maybe we can apply the, the third form that we've been using. But wait a minute, haven't we been treating nonlinear functions like they were linear already? All right, so uh, let's, let's see what, uh, what we can do with this. So we've already been guessing uh, basically one point. Uh, we've already been treating nonlinear functions like they're linear anyway. If we just guess an, another x value that's that's close to our first x value, right? Then we can get another output, and then from these two points we can approximate the slope. Uh, and then we linear basically evaluate uh, at uh, our first nominal. Technically, it doesn't matter which one we use here, uh, but um, we'll just use nominal for now because it makes our life easier uh, for the next step. Uh, and then once again, uh, I'm going to uh, we're going to iterate until uh, y star is equal to y n. All right. So now we've we've gone from a perfect knowledge of a perfectly linear function to uh, somewhat knowledge to a nonlinear function to absolutely no knowledge about the function whatsoever. Right. Uh, as long as we can value, like, give an input and get an output, uh, we're, we're good to press with this new method. So uh, I know what you're asking yourself. You're asking yourself, major right, what does this have to do with matrices, let alone the greatest matrix ever? All right. And I'll tell you. That was when we had one function. We had one input, one function, and one output. All right. Matrices come along when we start having multiple inputs, multiple functions, and multiple outputs. So let's start back with case one. All right. Case one, we just had uh, a linear operator, uh, input, linear operator, output. Well, now we have um, multiple inputs, multiple linear operators, and multiple outputs. But what you'll see is we can kind of construct the, the same um, solution, right? Like it can be expressed the same way as uh, y is equal to mx plus b, right? So in this case, uh, when we're solving for that y star, all we have to do is um, invert that a matrix, uh, pre-multiply both sides of the equation by the, the inverse of that a matrix, and we get that x star is equal to a inverse y star, all right? But what about when that, that matrix is, or those operators are nonlinear, all right? Well, if they're nonlinear, then we can treat them as linear, right? As long as we know those functions, right? If we know those functions, then we can uh, take the, the partial uh, partial derivative this time, all right? Because they're, they're functions of multiple variables. And we can construct, basically, this matrix, right? The, 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 
the rate of change of function one with respect to in, uh, input one. Uh, the rate of change of function one with respect to input two. The rate of change of function two with respect to input one. And the rate of change of, of function two with respect to input two. All right, it's just the, the slopes up here, right? But uh, we can actually construct uh, pretty much the same matrix uh, for nonlinear functions, right? Given that we know the function, we can actually evaluate this partial d uh, derivative, right? The rate of change of function one with respect to input one, the rate of change of function one with respect to input two, function two, input one, function two, input two, right? What we're going to say is that that is approximately equal to a, or that that is equal to a, but uh, right now, now we have, we bring back those approximations. And we get that the change in y is approximately equal to a times the change of x. All right, so uh, I don't think that I, I have the note on this one that it's uh, linear, but or that it's uh, nonlinear, so we have to repeat it. And it's iterative process. Um, so instead, I'll just I'll just go into an example. All right. So here's the example. Uh, we have the function of one of x1 and x2 is equal to x1 squared plus x2 squared. And function 2 of x1 and x2 is equal to 2x1, x2. All right? Uh, we want f1 to equal 45, and we want f2 to equal 40. Solve for the x1 and the x2. All right? Uh, because I know uh, my functions, um, I can actually make some pretty good guesses. All right? Uh, I know that uh, 5 times 4 is going to equal... 20 and 2 times 20 is 40, right? So I can, and I know that I want one of them to be bigger uh, because if, if x1 equals x2, then these two functions are the same. Uh, but if one of them is bigger, then, um, then this term is actually going to be bigger than, than this term, right? So uh, literally, I just chose an x1 and an x2 that satisfied function 2, uh, and I chose x1 larger than x2 uh, because I know that's what it's going to take to satisfy the first function, right? So uh, initial guess. I'm actually not that far off, right? Uh, y2 is spot on. It's 40, right? And I told you that's that's how I chose my x1 and x2. Uh, and then my my y1 is at 41, right? So it's it's a little bit bigger, uh, but it's not uh, bigger enough, right? So immediately uh, we can uh, construct the Jacobian, all right? So this is the Jacobian. It's the partial of f1 with respect to x1, uh, the partial of f1 with respect to x2, uh, and the partial of f2 with respect to x1, and the partial of f2 with respect to uh, x2. All right. Uh, now this is still a a matrix of functions, right? So we have to linearize about a point. Well, we have a nominal point, so let's linearize about that nominal point, uh, and we get that the uh, a matrix when evaluated at 5, 4 is 10, 8. Eight, four. Now I know my delta y, uh, my y1 needs to get bigger by 4, and my y2 is actually spot on. I don't need to change my y2. So uh, I'm going to say that my delta x is equal to a54 inverse delta y, and I get that I need to change my x1, make it one larger, and I need to change my x2 and make it almost one smaller. All right, so I get this new x value, uh, which is 6.1 and 3.1. All right, so now I, I literally just repeat the process, right? Uh, I now have a new nominal, uh, 6.1 and 3.1. I evaluate my y's, I get uh, 47 and 38. Uh, once again, my, my Jacobian uh, as a matrix of functions hasn't changed, but I'm linearizing about a different point. So I need to evaluate that Jacobian at my new nominal point. Uh, and I get 12.2, 6.2, 6.2, and 12.2. All right. Now my delta y's have changed. Uh, my, my f1 needs to get smaller by 2, and my f2 needs to get larger by 2. Uh, when I plug all of those in, uh, I get that uh, my delta x, my x1 needs to get smaller by about a third. My x2 needs to get bit bigger by about a third. So now I'm at uh, 5.7 and, and 3.4. All right. Uh, so with that information, I do it again. All right. So... 5.7 and 3.4, right up there at the top. Uh, evaluate, evaluate my y's. I get y1 is equal to 45, y, uh, 0.2, y2 is equal to uh, 39.8. And you see, like, we're about 0.2 off, right? We're, we're getting pretty close. We're only at iteration three. Granted, I started with a really good guess, all right? Uh, so uh, 
Once again, evaluate my, my A is a fun matrix of functions, hasn't changed, but I'm linearizing about a different point, so I have to evaluate my A at that point. Uh, and then if I come in here, uh, you'll see that, okay, I, I'm only changing my, my X by 500th, uh, and, and here's my, my new one. All right. So uh, actually, I think I think I'm going to be pretty good. Uh, let me let me double check to make sure that okay. Uh, after five iterations, uh, here's my x matrix, here's my y matrix, and oh look, I'm I'm accurate to five thousandths. All right. So my answer is actually x is equal to uh, five point seven two nine, uh, and my x two is equal to three point four four three, uh, and and those should be accurate to to quite a bit. Uh, I can theoretically continue this as many times as I want. If 5,000 5, isn't good enough, uh, then I, I can just keep going. Um, one of the benefits of knowing the functions is that I know from looking at the functions that I'm going to have two solutions. Uh, I also know that because both functions are uh, uh, commutative with respect to x1 and x2, uh, I actually get to uh, – it doesn't matter which one is x1 and which one is x2. Uh, if that makes sense. So I actually know not just one solution, uh, but I know both solutions. The second solution is that x1 equals 3.443 and x2 is equal to 5.729. Um, a little bit of gee whiz, but that's that's value added, uh, something that I, I know um, because uh, I, I know uh, the functions. All right, so now black box. All right. You think the black box went away? It didn't. Uh, so now all we know is that if we put in an x1 and x2, we get out uh, a y1 and a y2. All right. So this this looks kind of gnarly. So I'm going to go straight to the slides. And basically, what we're going to do is the same thing we did last time. All right. Uh, we want this Jacobian, uh, but instead we're going to have to settle for something that looks like a finite difference as opposed to an infinite small difference so let me click through this so if we can feed it one value of X's and get one value out so now uh, we need to guess a few more things all right previously we just guessed an XN right but now we're gonna need an XN as well as a DX1 and a DX2 all right uh, so uh, we're going to evaluate, because we have two inputs, we need a nominal evaluation uh, and we need uh, an evaluation where we just change x1, right, nominal plus dx1, uh, and then we're going to have an evaluation where we just change x2, so nominal initial conditions plus x2. Uh, if we plug those into our black box, we get the following outputs, uh, and they're pretty close because delta x1 and delta x2 are, are very small, right? Uh, we're probably within the precision of our um, calculator, our cal uh, Excel's output, uh, but uh, there's some stuff floating precision that's still behind the scenes. Uh, if you wanted to use kind of a matrix printout, you, you can kind of think about it like this, but it, it's, it's – I'm going to immediately drop that idea. Uh, because it's pretty pretty ridiculous, all right? Uh, so we can plug the values in, and uh, I didn't realize how many of these are uh, the, the exact same value, uh, so let me kind of highlight a few things, all right? So uh, the DX1, all right? Uh, that's, that's the DX1 that you chose. Specifically, it's going to be uh, the, the X1 uh, of our second guess minus the, the X1 of our nominal, right? So those two and all right uh, the, the dx2 right that you you kind of chose that at the beginning uh, but it's going to be the x2 of our uh, third evaluation minus our, our nominal x2 all right so here are our changes in uh, uh, f1 uh, our change in f1 with respect to the change in x1 right so we changed x1 we got a change in F1, uh, and then we changed X2, and we got a change in F2. Now we have to look at the change in F2, change in F2. So the second uh, row is our F2. Uh, we changed just uh, X1, and we got this change. We changed just X2, and we got this change. All right. So now if we actually plug in values, what we'll realize is that uh, if you evaluate all of those numbers, we get 10.00001, 8.00001, uh, 
and then pretty much within floating precision, 8 and 10. Uh, now, if we remember from example 1, uh, our A of 5, 4 was 10, 8, 8, 10. Uh, so if you guys want to guess which functions I use for this black box, you can. Uh, but if you want to start feeding those numbers back through using the functions from example 1, you can. All right. Uh, so basically, that is the exact first step, right? The exact output of the first step of um, the first step of the Jacobian method. Only this time we numerically constructed that Jacobian. So uh, you guys can actually, if you want to try to, to simulate, now that you know the functions, uh, if you want to kind of ignore those functions and construct those Jacobian matrices uh, numerically, you can. Uh, but that's essentially what we're doing. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, bring your questions to class and I will be happy to answer them. All right, thank you for your time.